Hello everyone and welcome to the Kirkup Pilot Grant Program Seminar Series. Today we have Dr. Emily Grice presenting on her pilot project, Impact of Residential Treatment on American Indian Maternal Child Health Outcomes. Dr. Grice received her PhD in Educational Psychology from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. She completed her postdoctoral work in health disparities and prevention research at Samford Research, where she is currently an associate scientist in the Center for Health Outcomes and Population Research. Dr. Grice's research focuses on longitudinal person-centered modeling, working to identify sources of resilience among peer victimized or at-risk youth. She is interested in examining longitudinal victimization rates and mental health outcomes among American Indian and rural youth in South Dakota. She currently leads evaluation efforts for a project working with American Indian male victims on the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. She also directs the Sanford Data Collaborative at Sanford Health. Her pilot grant project worked with mother-child dyads following their time in substance abuse residential treatment. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Emily Grice. As I mentioned, um, today I'm going to talk about the impact of residential treatment on American Indian maternal child health. Um, like I said, so this was really a collaborative effort between Sanford Research and some of our research associates here and myself and Volunteers of America Dakotas um, and really looking at um, getting the participants and really identifying the needs of that, that particular program um, that we worked with. Um, I want to go ahead and acknowledge our funding source. So this is funded through NIH, through NIMHD, and particularly um, an award to Dr. Elliott. And then just go ahead and uh, mention that this does not necessarily represent the official view of NIH. Um, so in terms of background for the particular study, so substance use we know is undesirable for all individuals, um, but it's especially undesirable for pregnant and parenting women. Um, and this is obviously because it impacts not only the health of the mother, but we know that it can impact the health and recovery of the child as well. And so there's a lot of literature obviously out there around uh, prenatal alcohol exposure, prenatal substance exposures, um, but we know a little bit less about the impact that substance use can have in the postnatal period. What we find is that 70% of women in substance abuse treatment have children, and that these women are two times more likely to actually lose custody of their children. Um, during that time period. So significant kind of risk around this particular population. Uh, and to date, studies have really focused primarily on maternal health outcomes. And so when we look at post-treatment research, we tend to follow up with the mothers. And there's been less research that really looks at following up with the mother and the child together and how has um, treatment, how has the recovery process gone um, kind of as a dyad. What we know about early childhood development um, is that environmental factors, in particular SES, so this includes things like maternal um, educational attainment, parental occupation, and household income, um, that those are highly uh, associated with positive childhood outcomes. And so what we find is that maternal education, in particular, can be highly linked to early language development, exposure to reading, and that substance-using mothers, in particular, are less likely to have attained um, a high school degree or any further education um, past that degree. We also know that um, these women tend to live in, in higher rates of poverty, and so that can also impact the actual resources that they have available um, within their home for their child. We also see that substance use can really present some barriers to the mother and the child in terms of their parenting relationship. Um, substance use in particular often impacts that parent-child relationship in terms of uh, the, the responsivity that the mother is able to give the child. So are they warm towards their child? Are they responsive to the needs of their child? Um, we also find that mothers who, who are going through residential treatment or who have a substance use um, dependency tend to, be, uh, tend to have less social support available to them and in turn, obviously, impacts their, their ability to um, give support to their child as well. Unfortunately, we find that substance use among pregnant and parenting women is even higher, and especially concerning for American Indian and Alaskan Native women. Uh, about 41% of American Indian and Alaskan Native uh, women, pregnant and parenting women, begin uh, child-rearing as adolescents. And we find that their substance abuse admissions have increased for these women, for these young women in particular, um, while we've seen a decrease across the rest of the population. And so we're still seeing kind of increasing rates in this population, even though we're seeing it going down um, amongst others. 
And we find that overall, American Indian Alaska Native adults seek treatment at twice the rate of the national average. So we see that for this particular population that um, there's some significant uh, risk uh, for American Indian Alaska Native uh, pregnant and parenting women. So today, we've, we've started to understand a little bit more of, of the context around American Indian and Alaska Native substance use and recovery. We know that it's highly complex, that there's a lot of variables that obviously go into it. There's a lot of literature out there and that does talk about historical trauma and the impact that might have on substance use. Um, and so continuing to kind of understand what are the specific variables that surround these women um, and how do, we, how do we provide the best programming that we can for them. Um, so a lot of programs have tried to and work towards going towards more culture-specific programming um, and that that can be a really important aspect of treatment for these women. Um, however, to date, a lot of the studies haven't really looked at what are the actual mechanisms that are working well. If we provide culturally relevant programming, what is it about the cultural, um, culturally relevant programming that's actually working? What kind of lasts past um, their, actually tr their actual treatment time and into their post-treatment time. Uh, so that leads us to our study aims. And so for this particular study, um, we kind of had two kind of larger aims, um, and then the third was, re was really a um, program dissemination or findings um, that we disseminated. So the first was to examine maternal child health and home environment outcomes of post-treatment mothers and their children. Uh, so we're looking at that mother-child relationship, that dyad, and, and what that looked like. Uh, we were also interested in examining the cultural relevance of a particular program for pregnant and parenting women and its desired outcome for American Indian women and their children. And then finally, we looked to, de to develop and deliver program recommendations uh, to that program regarding their cultural relevance for American Indian women and maternal child health. So today I'm going to talk mainly about the two, first two study aims, um, and then as you're kind of hearing those findings, you'll probably put together a lot of the um, actual implications in the uh, program recommendations that we were able to provide um, to the program. Um, so just a little bit more about the, the program itself. So the program is based out of Volunteers of America, um, and they work primarily with pregnant and parenting women um, and their children. And so the, the program obviously provides specific services to the women, but children are also able to live um, in the residential treatment with their, with their mothers. Um, and so that was our primary area of recruitment. Um, this particular program tends to have about 60 to 70 percent um, of their population is American Indian. And we also see that about, um, I think there are most recent rates were close to 99 percent of the women coming in at the poverty level. Uh, so recruitment, the mothers had to have successfully co completed the residential treatment program. So um, obviously there's several women who um, kind of fall out throughout the program's uh, time period. These were women who had gone through the program and had completed it successfully. Um, and then also who currently had a child residing with them. And that also um, kind of limited our recruitment pool, pool a little bit as well because a lot of the women who um, who had gone through the program, maybe even successfully, still didn't have custody of their child, but we were really interested, of those mothers who did have custody, what was that um, home environment like? So in terms of the recruitment process, we often had a case manager or someone who worked directly with Volunteers of America, um, identify the women, kind of talk with them a little bit about the program, at least get them warmed up to the idea, and then we would have a research associate who would go ahead and give them a call um, and see if we could set up a time to come to their home. So we actually went to their homes to do the study. Um, and that, so some barriers to that we, is obviously a very highly transient population. So they're moving, they're just getting out of treatment, and so they're trying to figure out um, a, maybe a more permanent living situation. A lot of the women that we worked with were living in a transitional um, living environment that the Volunteers of America um, has available for them. So they were able to kind of transition into that. Um, it was a independent living, but it was transitional. Um, and so that was really where we were able to do a lot of our um, recruitment for this particular study. So I have never worked so hard for 19 participants, <laughs> our 19 mother-child dyads. So, you know times two. Um, but what we had for a breakdown, we had um, about an even split between American Indian and Caucasian um, participants. We saw that their average annual household income was around 16000 so obviously clearly below 
um, the poverty level. Uh, average maternal age was around 27. Average child age was around 27 months, so around that two, two years um, of age. So what we did, like I mentioned, was we went into the home. It took about an hour for us to, to do the actual study, and we did a maternal interview, which I'll talk about the questions um, here in just a second, and then we did an actual home assessment of the mother and the child. So specific aim one, again, was to examine the impact of that particular program on maternal child health and the home environment of these patients and their children um, post-treatment. So this so for this particular part, we um, collected quantitative data. So I have it kind of split out. I'll talk about the quantitative findings and then our qualitative findings here. Um, the home observation for measurement of the environment inventory or the home in inventory is what we used when we went in and looked at the mother and the child and how they interacted. Uh, this is a 45 item structured observational interview. So that really means we had some specific interview questions that we would ask the mom, but we would also just kind of watch their interaction. So there was a lot of observation of what does the home environment look like? How are the mom and the child interacting as we're talking? How is the mom interacting with us? Um, so really looking at quality and quantity of stimulation, structure, and support that was available within the home environment. Uh, there's four subscales to this particular inventory. We have parental warmth. Um, does that parent positively vocalize to their child while we're there? Uh, do they maybe caress or do they kiss their child at least once while we're there? Are they showing some type of affection or warmth towards their child? Um, that we would see some type of lack of hostility, that they're not shouting at the child or scolding the child while we're there. Um, we also look at some learning and literacy um, items. And these were always kind of interesting to see, does the child have three or more books of their own? And we would usually ask them on that. Sometimes we would see, you know, books sitting out, and so that would give us an indication, and we would maybe ask, you know, are these the child's books? Um, and that would, again, kind of help us understand more about that environment. Uh, and then we would ask the parent particularly, um, you know, do you read with your child? Do you sit down and have that time um, with them at least a couple times a week? And then verbal skills, does the parent converse freely and easily? Um, do they kind of have interchanges with us as a visitor? Some, um, sometimes you'll go in and they really don't talk with you much or they're, they're very kind of close-ended in their conversations versus having a little bit more of a conversation with you. So what we found um, in terms of the home the home inventory in particular, at least. So, so we examined several potential demographic and treatment variables. So we looked at kind of length of stay, that the mom had been in treatment. Um, we looked at race, um, age, um, maternal education, income level. Again, we didn't have a ton of variability in the income level. Um, and what we found that was that maternal education was the strongest predictor that we could find in the model. And so when we looked at um, the correlations, maternal education was highly correlated with the home scores. And when we looked at, kind of did some follow-up examination of that, we found that parental warmth and learning and literacy in particular, um, there, were, there were distinct differences there. So women who had less than a high school degree, and we had about an even split here. We had an N of 9 that had less than a, than a high school degree. We had an N of 10 who had a high school degree or more. Um, and what we found was that those who had less than a high school degree were significantly lower than those with a high school degree or above on the parental warmth scale and the learning and literacy scale. For our, for our publication that we actually just sent in, we were also able to do a comparison with a non-treatment group. And so we were able to look at, um, this wasn't data that we had collected with this particular study, but we had home um, inventory uh, scores from a very similar group that hadn't gone through treatment. They, uh, we were able to control for SES, so, or at least for income, so they were all less than 40,000 um, as an annual income per year. And what we found was that the only thing that was still kind of different between those two was the learning and literacy, so that those in the treatment group were significantly lower than those in the non-treatment group in terms of the learning and literacy subscale. So for this, for this kind of part of the study, at least the quantitative piece, again, we found that the, the parental warmth and support for learning and literacy was 
significantly associated with maternal education and that those with the lower maternal education showed lower home scores on those subscales. Um, we know that maternal education is often associated with employment opportunities, uh, financial security. Women who have um, higher education tend to show a little bit more self-confidence in their ability um, because of a lot of those other variables, including employment and financial security. And so it's likely that that kind of provided a greater stability in the home, and with that stability, maybe more opportunities for the mother to be able to uh, respond to their child in those kind of warm ways, versus a mother who uh, may have had difficulties um, getting a, a job or having that financial security, there's just really less of that um, maybe part of you that's even available to be warm to your child, to have that, that energy, um, to really have that positive parent-child interaction. Um, and also kind of seeing the value in providing that richer home learning environment, and that would come through that learning and literacy scale. But they see, you know, the need to have books in your home, even if your child is only six months old. Um, those are still some of the interview questions that stick with me. I remember talking with a lot of the moms, and um, if they had a child who was really even under two, there were several moms who uh, were just surprised that we even asked that there would be a book in the home. Like, my child doesn't read yet. Why would I have a book available for them? Um, they really like the TV. You know, they're interested in that. Like, we don't really read that much. And there really wasn't a, um, a reaction to, to their responses. It was really, like, that was just the expectation that, of course, you wouldn't have books in the home for a child that young. Um, so really kind of seeing that difference in the mothers who had some um, educational attainment and, and the way that they looked at the home learning environment. In terms of the comparison with the non-treatment, we saw that difference in the support for learning and literacy. Uh, when we looked at the main effects, there was um, that, that significance was only there among the low education groups. And what that kind of shows us is that particularly for those um, who had a higher education, whether they were in treatment or not in treatment, um, they were showing higher learning and literacy scores. But for the low treatment, if they were or for the low um, education, if they were in treatment uh, or they had, you know, just gone through treatment, we saw significantly lower learning and literacy scores than those who hadn't. Um, so just kind of that accumulation, I think, of stressors for that, for that group of women who had just gone through treatment and also were likely having difficulties uh, finding a job, had that lower education, um, some of those variables surrounding that SES. Uh, specific aim two then was to examine the cultural relevance of the New START program and its desired outcomes for American Indian women and their children. And so this was some of our qualitative findings. This is what came from the actual maternal interview that we did with the moms. So within this interview, we um, asked the moms about their culture. We had them define their culture themselves. So we asked them, tell us what you um, consider to be your culture, um, what are some of the things that drive your values, what's important to you. Um, we asked them about their culture and how it related to their recovery. So thinking about their culture, how did this impact your recovery? Um, we talked a little bit about the actual program itself. Did you feel like the program staff were accepting of you and your culture? Um, because there's a lot of backgrounds of women that are actually in, the, uh, in this program, you know, how did you feel like the, the program staff kind of treated women of different, of different cultural backgrounds? So we were able to get a little bit about their background, about their recovery process, and the cultural impact of that. And what we found in this qualitative data was really three main themes that emerged. We found that culture, looking at cultural beliefs, practices, and values, um, that recovery, and then talking about kind of the overall program were kind of the, the big themes. So I'll go through some of the bigger themes and show you some of the um, actual quotes from the women. So in terms of cultural beliefs and practices, the women tended to talk about three uh, main sub-themes. They often talked about religion, kind of more mainstream religion. I go to church every Sunday. I'm Christian. I believe in God. Um, other women talked about specifically traditional, traditional native culture. So I go to sweats, sun dances, ceremonies, powwows. Um, so talking about specific uh, practices. And then a lot of them also talked about family as kind of an overarching uh, culture. So that was really interesting. When we asked some of the women, they, they didn't really identify what we would think of culture in terms of maybe race, ethnicity. They really talked about it as, well, my family is what's important to me, and that's that's really what I view my culture as, my family, my friends, my support system, that's my, that's my culture. 
uh, some of the women, or actually quite a few of the women, primarily the Native women, uh, described a hybrid of more mainstream religion and traditional culture. Uh, so for this woman in particular, she talked about um, kind of what her mom had done and that her mom hadn't really chosen between uh, maybe more mainstream religion and um, her Native culture. Um, so she says she didn't, she didn't make us choose, like going to church growing up, believing that way. But she also let us go to powwows, like one I just came from this weekend. Um, she goes to powwows and stuff. She just doesn't believe in the actual, like, the sweats and stuff like that. And that's where I'm at right now. And that's what I want my kids to do. So she talks about kind of how she wants her kids to kind of have this mixture um, and not really have to choose one or the other. So really kind of this, this um, hybrid in terms of, of thinking about their culture. In terms of cultural values, we saw two kind of main sub-themes come up. A lot of the women talked about their family in particular, that their family is very important to them, um, talking both about kind of the, the uh, immediate family and extended family, and then also talking about um, traditional Native values. So um, that they talked about that this is really important for me to be a good person, um, that being close with, with nature, um, that children are sacred, that women are sacred. So talking about some of those important values to them. Women then identified uh, what was really important in their recovery process, what were some of the recovery resources that they had. Almost all of the women um, talked about group resources in particular. So this included things like Alcoholics Anonymous or Bible studies, um, Wellbriety, which I'll talk about a little bit more um, here in a second. And this was really consistent with prior research that we see that talks about the importance of that social support in the recovery process. Um, so one woman talked about just feeling of everybody being there and it's just, I don't know, just staying connected to everyone and knowing that people are going through the same struggle. So a lot of women just really talked about, you know, if you can talk with someone um, or talk in a group with other people who are going through the same thing as you are, obviously that's very important to, to your recovery process. Um, some of the women did talk about more individual resources of being able to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with, um, with program staff or with other women in the program. But again, group resources was the most highly uh, mentioned. Women did talk about the Native-specific resources. So in this particular program, they did work to incorporate some culture-specific um, resources in the everyday kind of programming. And one of those in particular was the Wellbriety. And this is really um, a Native-focused um, Alcoholics Anonymous group. So this woman talks about it's called Wellbriety. It has a lot to do with, like, the four directions. That's big in the Native American cultures. And then we smudge. Um, she talks about it being a big stress reliever for her, so I'm always leave feeling millions of times better. I can notice when I don't go um, at least once a week. And so, again, just kind of talking about how important it was for her to have that connection um, and reinforcing the importance of culturally relevant programming for that particular, uh, for um, at least for most of the Native women that were in the program talked about Wellbriety quite consistently. In terms of their kind of decision-making post-treatment, a lot of the women also talked about family. Um, the family in particular was more frequently mentioned among the Native mother, or yeah, the Native participants, um, talking about the um, importance of the family um, in their kind of motivation to remain sober post-treatment. More frequently among the non-Native mothers, they talked about some of their intrinsic reasons for wanting to go through the recovery process and maintaining sobriety. Um, so this mother in particular says, I was there because I wanted to be there. I didn't go there so I could get my kids back or do something. I went there so I could learn how to be sober, learn how to cope. And that was the main thing. I didn't know um, how to cope with stuff. And so for her, it was really, how do I do this for, for myself? Um, in terms of recovery support systems, again, we see family being a very important component to that. We also saw a lot of the women talking about the extended family support, so the concept of family including both blood and non-blood networks. Um, so some of the women talked about, you know, my, my daughter's parents um, would check in with me every day. That was really important for me to have kind of that larger um, support system as well.
We also found kind of different types of support being important. And so in particular, um, we saw that emotional support was really important. The American Indian women um, placed more importance on the emotional support. We saw that they um, were more likely to, to respond specifically about emotional support. So saying things like, if I'm stressed about something or I'm just, you know, just ready to give up or whatever, then she's, you know, because she's been there down the ro same road as I've been. So again, kind of talking about that, having an individual available there for them to provide kind of that support to them, um, that they've been there. I've gone through this myself. I know what you're going through and I'm going to provide that specific support to you. Uh, a lot of the women did talk about a lack of support or really that they had individuals in their lives who weren't necessarily um, promoting sobriety or promoting their continued recovery. And so talking about um, that they have, maybe their mom's a good support system, but her sisters aren't. They still drink, and so being around them can be obviously detrimental to the recovery process. Um, and again, if you, know, if you don't have that support system, how detrimental that, that was to them in their recovery process. Uh, this was an interesting finding. I felt like, um, in terms about uh, in terms of the program itself and its cultural competence. Uh, so a lot of the non-native women uh, said that the program really lacked cultural competence for them, and so they felt like the program really focused on if they had any cultural components to it that it really focused on the native culture, and that as a non-native woman that that um, wasn't necessarily helpful for them. That they weren't able to really find kind of the translation of how do those value, how are those values important for me? Um, so one woman said they do a lot of Native American stuff and I'm not Native American, so I'm not comfortable going to Albriety and doing that stuff. I just feel, um, you know, just don't feel as welcome there because I'm not Native American. And we, we found that with a couple of the different women just kind of talking about um, how they felt like maybe there could be some, some resources that we're maybe a little bit more open or maybe translating the specific. So if, if we're talking about specific native resources, how do the values behind that translate kind of across cultures? How do we make sure that these women identify um, the importance of those values for anybody? Um, they talked about the program staff in particular and how important they were for that emotional support for their relationships. And a lot of them, um, obviously these names are changed, um, a lot of them talked about maintaining contact with particular um, people within the program. So even after they were in the program, that their case manager continued to follow up with them, that they were, and some of these women, um, so most of the women that we talked with were between three months and a year out of out of the program, but for even for those who had been you know, out of the program for six, seven months, um, still having that contact, still knowing that they could pick up the phone and talk to someone was really important to them, uh, particularly someone from the program who understood kind of what the recovery process had looked like. But overall, we did find that the program had kind of positive impact on these women. They talked about a lot of the particular skills that they were able to take away, that they you know, had, had learned a lot through their parenting classes, um, that they were able to figure out more about themselves and, and what was important to them, what kind of their triggers were, what their coping skills were, and how they could use that post-treatment. Uh, so the qualitative findings in particular helped us to identify those factors associated with treatment outcomes for American Indian pregnant and parenting women, but also for non-native women. So kind of understanding, you know, women who are going through this program that has that's attempting, that's trying to include some cultural resources, what are we seeing the women's outcomes looking like? Um, and really beginning to understand the specific cultural and social mechanisms that were used in their recovery. So again, a lot of the literature out there um, does kind of a quick post-treatment follow-up with, with the mom and maybe looks at uh, whether they're maintaining their sobriety or not and maybe some, some variables around that. Um, but it was good to be able to get the mom to talk about their the, the program and really what was important to them um, in that process. Um, and for us, you know, having a split of Native and non-Native women, it really helped us to understand kind of how each of them identified um, particular needs for them as an individual woman. Uh, we had hypothesized that the American Indian women in particular would identify cultural aspects um, as supporting their recovery, and we did see women talk about the specific uh, culture, uh, the culturally specific resources that were in the program, but we also found that a lot of the women had kind of difficulty identifying particular aspects of their culture. So 
when we asked women to identify, you know, what is your culture? What, what's important to you? It was, it was interesting to have them, a lot of them either kind of paused and had to just step back and kind of think, how do I define myself? I'm not really sure how, how I do that. Um, so we, we, I was surprised by that part. We, I think we thought that um, women would be more readily able to talk about their culture, and it was really interesting that a lot of them um, really had to think about what were the, their values that really drove um, who they are and their recovery and what was important to them. Um, but we did find that across all of the women that their description of culture tended to include kind of the values of family and community and obviously that support was really important for them. Um, again, we had hypothesized that familial support would be especially important for American Indian women and we found that they relied on their community including kind of those what we wouldn't consider maybe to be um, non-familiar relationships, um, more extended family relationships, but that those were very important, kind of having that whole support system for them. Um, aspects of the American Indian culture were obviously evident in the mechanisms that they continued to use in the recovery as well. So some limitations of this particular study, uh, it was very difficult to get uh, women to be part of the study. It was a really highly transient population. So even if we were able to identify the women before they left the program, um, they often um, either didn't have a, a permanent home or somewhere where we could go visit. Um, they Maybe their phone would get turned off at a certain time um, and we wouldn't be able to follow up or their phone number would change and so it was difficult to maintain that contact. Um, so what we did find is that the sample may not be representative of all mothers and children that were actually part of the program. Um, most of the women that we followed up with stayed here um, in an urban location versus uh, the women who likely went back maybe to the reservation or to a rural community um, that we weren't able to follow up with them. Uh, some of the implications obviously in terms of the qualitative data really reinforce the importance of culture specific programming but taking into consider kind of consideration individual um, kind of thoughts about what their culture are and what would be important to them in their recovery process. So when we talk to the program, when we're able to give them kind of those program recommendations, kind of getting them to, you know, do you talk with the women when they first come in about what are, what are some of those important social supports or cultural supports that would be important for you as you go through this program? And then obviously from the quantitative findings, we're really able to identify the importance of maternal education. Uh, so when we talked with uh, the program and we were able to give them their program recommendations, we also talked about um, encouraging the women to uh, get their GED or a high school degree while they were in the program if they could provide that, um, that opportunity for them to continue working towards their education even when they're in, during, when they're in the program, um, particularly those who are in maybe the more low intensity program, that would be helpful. Um, and then to continue educating about early childhood learning and literacy. I think for all of us who did the, um, the interviews with the moms and the kids, that was, I think, the thing that really stuck out to us, that there wasn't even, um, that there was a hesitation that there should be books or that there should be that learning environment available to their child. And so being able to encourage that even during maybe parenting classes of, you know, what does your home environment look like? How are you trying to stimulate your child? Um, how do we continue to, to um, talk with them about how important that early childhood developmental period is? All right, so I wanted to say thank you, obviously, to our community um, organization uh, individuals who are really key in getting our participants and just in getting the study up and running. Here at Stanford Research, uh, Luke Mack and Tracy McMahon were huge in um, coming along uh, to these homes and to actually getting the participants. Um, and then H Haley McCarran was actually a summer student that worked with me this summer. Um, she's at Augustana University and she um, did a lot of the qualitative data analysis and assisted in getting through all of that. Um, and then also thank you, obviously, to the Kirk Accords. It was nice to be able to have the support throughout this process um, in terms of regulatory and, and doing the analyses and, and all of that. So, questions? <laughs>